uh, there could be a couple of questions in the end, something like that. Um, but uh, we are flexible. If you want to 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 use less than one hour and twenty, that's fine too. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And certainly, yeah. please do feel free to ask questions as they come up. Yeah. Thank you. And, and it's our pleasure uh, to welcome Craig McIntosh from UC San Diego. So to our uh, seminar series, it's a, it's a big pleasure. Actually, uh, Craig was on our list for several years, actually, in my list. Um, and, uh, and Craig is going to, to talk about search costs, intermediation and trades, uh, and uh, using experimental evidence from Uganda. So Craig, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Pedro, and thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, this is this is a project we we wrote the first grant for this project seven years ago. Uh, so this project has really taken our lives over for many many years now, uh, and we've just started presenting the results. So so this is only my second time to present, and I think this will be a really great group to get feedback from. So I, I appreciate the invitation. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Lauren Bergquist from University of Michigan, who has a variety of uh, really interesting projects looking at the way that agricultural markets are functioning in Africa. Um, and what this paper is doing is, is really trying to understand fundamentally how big a piece of the puzzle are search costs in explaining the way that food markets are working in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, uh, so obviously it would be sort of difficult to point at any market, any single market that has deeper welfare consequences for, for a large group of people than the way that these core staple food markets work in Africa. So not only is it the case that the large majority of the poor in Sub-Saharan Africa live in rural areas and are dependent on agriculture for employment, which emphasizes the, the importance of food markets on the supply side, but even a large group of people who live in rural areas and work as farmers also rely on food markets as buyers as well. So 20 to 40% of Ugandan farmers are net buyers depending on the season. So uh, people are on both sides of this market at once. Uh, it tends to be the case that a single staple grain makes up an enormous share of the calories that a normal family eats in a day and so the way that the prices and the price variability and the market efficiency operates in these food markets is just a really first order, uh, first order issue. So uh, there was a large wave of liberalization of the way that food markets worked uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s and 90s, uh, but we still see very large variation in prices across regions and across seasons. Um, and these variations tend to get more extreme as one moves out into shallower, uh, and more isolated rural markets. So very clearly, we have real issues around transportation. We have real issues around storage. Those are, you know, kind of billions of dollars of investments uh, in order to try to to make those markets function more efficiently. And so, really, what this project is premised on is this idea that there's been increasing focus in recent years on search costs as another potential mechanism for why these markets may not function in a highly integrated way. And the investments that seem to be need to be made to improve the search cost problem are much smaller investments, right? So at some level, we're looking at kind of the million dollar investment to think about really revolutionizing the way that search costs work in these markets relative to billions and billions of dollars required to invest in the deep uh, transport and storage infrastructure that will clearly really fundamentally alter the way the markets work. So, this project, in a sense, can be thought of as trying to understand how far can we get with that million dollar investment before having to make those much deeper investments behind it. So what I'll be presenting is uh, an experiment that tried to kind of throw all of the ICT tools that we could think of at the food market problem at the same time with the idea that we thought that there were you know, a, a relatively large number of studies looking at one piece or another piece at a time, and that literature had generally been fairly disappointing. And so what we're trying to do here is to say, if we move kind of the whole information and trading structure at the same time, what can we achieve? So what we're coming with then is a, is a multi-dimensional intervention. So the heart of it is a platform called Kudu, 
uh, which is a clearinghouse that matches buyers and sellers of agricultural commodities with each other in completely new ways. So it brings in totally new set of buyers uh, into rural markets and gives farmers a different conduit to large markers, markets than they had previously had. Uh, this thing is accessible via a feature phone. Uh, it also has a smartphone app. It also can be used on a computer, but it's, it's a technology whose purpose is to allow it to be used on the, on the most basic kind of mobile phone particularly in terms of posting asks, which is what the farmers will be doing generally. Um, we also set up a very large system that gathered biweekly price information in uh, more than 250 markets for three years uh, across Uganda. And then we set up a large scale system that was uh, broadcasting that information back to both sides of the market, sellers and buyers via SMS. And so taken kind of as a whole, this represents a unique effort to inform both sides of the market and offer new trading options to, to uh, market participants at scale. The experiment is randomized across 110 sub-counties. So the, the experiment covers 12% of Uganda. Um, there are you know, about 50,000 people in each sub-county. And so this is a randomization at scale we're able to speak in, in a number of ways to, to GE effects, and we see GE effects on market prices in a number of different ways. And we had the whole system running for three full years. So the, the, the effort was really to see, you know, would the markets change in a more fundamental way? Now, something I'll flag for you is, you know, for those of you used to running experiments, you're gonna look at 110 units across which it is randomized and say, that's actually not a very big experiment. And that's going to kind of show up in the results that at some level, this is an absolutely enormous experiment. And at some other level, it's relatively underpowered in that it takes place only in 110 units. So you'll see, you'll see that showing up in the way that the results look. So, so then in order to understand what was going on, um, we had these market surveys that were being done both in control and treatment trading centers, and then also going out into the uh, very large national markets that trade to the capital and trade out to the borders. Uganda is a major food exporter. It's a breadbasket country. So there are large exports of maize that move out of Uganda into Kenya, into South Sudan, and into the Eastern DRC as well. So it's uh, the international trade is actually quite important. Um, we then uh, drew in a large sample of traders who were working in the study markets at the baseline, and we tracked them across three survey waves to understand what was happening to their profits and the geographic nature of their trading behavior. And then we did a fairly straightforward uh, sampling of farming households stratified by distance to these trading centers, and we did a, a baseline and end line survey with them to try to understand what was going on with farm business. So, just to give a quick preview of the results, because there, there's kind of a lot going on in the study and we, we may get bogged down in detail. So, so just to, to kind of give the overview in one place. So the platform did increase trade. Um, it led to a higher probability of trade and a higher volume of trade between market dyads when both markets were treated. And in fact, even when one of the markets in a dyad was treated. Uh, it increased entry. So there were new traders who came in and began operating in traded markets, uh, in, in treated markets and began uh, trading between them. And it led to a squeeze on price dispersion in a number of different ways. So there's a kind of a general convergence result from the intervention that uh, price dispersion across markets converges, profit margins across traders converge. So there's a kind of an, a homogenization that occurs as a result of the information that, and, the, and the trading opportunities that we bring in. Um, as you might expect to see, we find that prices are falling in relative deficit areas and rising in relative surplus areas, right? So, so, so it does have the effect of kind of connecting up markets it, it, more pronounced than any effect on raising prices overall, which is there, but it's muted. More pronounced than that is this idea that it leads to convergence in prices across markets. We see uh, no change at all in market level average prices, and then uh, a, a small increase for farmers uh, in terms of the farm gate prices that they receive. Somewhat surprisingly, we find that the effects are concentrated in markets that are close to one another. So the, the, the effects of the platform are, are monotonically increasing in, uh, monotonically decreasing in the distance in, in a market dyad. So it really does look like what happened is despite what you might have thought from the way I described it, the platform is actually facilitating 
short distance trade and not long distance trade. Um, and then we see a real squeeze on the profit of incumbent traders. So, uh, so, so the, their overall revenues fall significantly despite the fact that their overall uh, uh, volumes go up. So effectively, these, these are intermediaries who live off of the price dispersion that this platform reduced. And so although it enabled them to increase their trading volumes and decrease their, their trading profits, okay? So um, the adoption of the platform is much higher among traders than farmers. Um, as a result, we're much better powered to speak to what happens to traders than we are to farmers. When we look in farmers, what we're seeing is, you know, it's, it's basically an increase in farm gate prices that is relatively large in magnitude, but is insignificant for, I think, the reasons that I described. But what we see is that when we look at farmers, the, the, the benefits for farmers are very regressive. So they're, they're very definitely concentrated among the farmers who were selling the most to begin with, were the most exposed to the market uh, to begin with. And so these are the ones who really have the incentive to pay the fixed cost uh, to search and adopt new technologies. And this is an idea that has run through the search cost literature for quite a while. And, and for example, Treb Allen's Econometrica paper uh, features farm size very fundamentally in terms of, of, of thinking about the incentive to search. So essentially what we're finding here is that these platforms can help to integrate markets. As they integrate markets, they are going to have a tendency to reduce intermediary profits, but they don't really cut out the middleman in any totally substantive way for your average farmer. And instead, what they're doing is really basically taking those people who are already heavily market exposed uh, and allowing them to get slightly better prices as these markets integrate, okay? So it's a fairly complicated story where there are real harms to some, some study participants. There are benefits to other study participants. Of course, there are many, many, many more farmers than there are traders. And so I'll show you a little welfare calculation that we do at the end, which is basically totally dominated by the fact that there are so many farmers of whom our farm sample is representative that once you think about the population impact on all farmers and all traders, the platform ends up being extremely positive in a cost benefit sense, really strictly because of the scale of the number of farmers that it is able to help. Okay. So uh, just a, a quick outline, I'll talk a little bit about the literature, run through the context and design, um, and then kind of go through the impacts on each of the three different market types, the, the market survey itself, the traders and the farmers. Um, and then I'll wrap up with some discussion of, of how we're thinking about uh, the welfare effects and that's still uh, to some extent work in progress. So I'm certainly very happy to hear your thoughts about how we should be thinking. So, Craig, I have a question or two, a couple of questions. So um so i was wondering a little bit you probably are going to talk about these things of course but um i was wondering a little bit about i mean since this is mainly about access to to this platform and information um and since your results are, are uh, a lot um, in terms of uh, prices in 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 close by markets I, I was wondering about you know whether there could be some kind of time pattern here uh, where you would find more effects in the beginning, but then in terms of um, comparisons with the control group, things would be would be um, less uh, less uh, less. I mean, uh, smaller smaller effects. Uh, and then the second the second point is um, uh, about farmers. So what 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 type of farmers are are we talking about here? So. Uh, because to a certain extent, I mean, um, if we are talking about very small farmers, probably there is no way they can invest on ways to get to the to the markets. Uh, but if if market if if farmers are a bit uh, a bit uh, you know uh, larger size, uh, then there, there there could be more of a of a chance. So um, so those would be my my first two comments. Yeah, so the, the, the first question is obviously a pretty complicated one, and there's a, there's a lot uh, wrapped up into what you asked, right? So I think the, the multiple things that one would want to think about there, so first of all, you're putting on the table the fact that these large kinds of interventions are likely to have spillovers, and that, that I think is the case, and we're right now deep down in analysis looking at those spillover effects. I won't talk much about it now, 
they're there, they're not large enough that they wipe out what our control group is showing. So I don't think the reason that we fail to find long distance trade effects is coming from the spillovers. What I, what I would probably put that at the floor of is it, it basically two features. So the first one is that, you know, when you're talking about long distance trade, you're talking about trade where the non-search cost barriers are very high, right? You're gonna, you're gonna spend an enormous amount of money to move the grain over long distances. So as, as you would know better than anyone, right, the, the counterfactual here is not no information. The counterfactual is ubiquitous mobile phones, right? So I, I think we really have to come at these quote unquote technology interventions, you know, with a very clear understanding of just how connected these people already are and that these traders live and die on their mobile phones. They're on the phone all day long. I'll show you data showing you how much they use their phones. So basically, I think my, my read of this is basically that the mobile phones give them quite a strong signal of what prices are all over the country. And to the extent that there are benefits from doing long distance trade, the phones have already revealed those. So we may be revealing that they had slight mistakes in what they thought prices were in distant markets, but those slight corrections are not enough to overcome the very large pecuniary cost in, to conduct that trade. So if you think of what our intervention is doing is basically just kind of decreasing the variance of their price expectations somewhat, right? And it's, it's not going from infinity to zero. It's going from the mobile phone level to, to, to the level that we can generate with this technology. That delta, I think, is more likely to clear the pecuniary cost barrier when it is low and therefore that short. So I think that's probably the most important answer. Another thing that we've wrestled with a little bit is that we sampled the traders into the study as a function of where they live. And so, and so that means that all of the traders in our study really are the small traders who reside in the rural markets that we're studying. So there is a layer, which is really a very important layer of large traders conducting large, long distance trade all the way across the country. They're the ones operating really huge trucks. They live in the capital and we didn't sample them into the study, right? So, so I think it's just kind of important to recognize that we have a lens. The lens is on the behavior of relatively small traders. And so it may be that that lens is not letting us see what's happening with this long distance trade really correctly. Um, so then on the, on the farmer side, uh, we basically just put, uh, we listed uh, what are called LC1s, the, lo the smallest local council designation, uh, essentially a village. So I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail, but we basically listed all the households engaged in permanent maize agriculture and then randomly sampled from them. So I, I think we have a really normal representative sample of farmers, including very small farmers. It will be you know, predominantly very small farmers, given the way that we sampled, we didn't, you know, begin from a group of farmers who are already interacting with the market. We, we began from a sample of farmers who are just growing maize. So, so I, you know, I think we had, we had a large number of people who weren't really engaging with markets much to begin with. And in that sense, it's not so surprising that a market intervention didn't affect them. What is maybe a little more surprising is, you know, there, there's a sort of a blurring on the edge that our large farmers are also engaging in trade on both sides of the market. And we're actually seeing farmers coming onto the people that we call farmers coming onto the platform as buyers as well as sellers, right? So I think on the, on the margin, the distinction between what a small trader in a rural town is and what a large farmer who's heavily exposed to the market is, those, that becomes a very blurry distinction in, in reality. And it's really the people at that intersection who are who are using the platform a lot. Can I ask? So Please. Do these increases in trade lead to increases in output? No. So we 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 didn't really. I mean, of course, that was a dream that we had that this might be such a deep intervention that, you know, as farmers started to realize that they were selling into a deeper market they realize that you know, essentially the, the, the elasticity of price has changed and it would allow them to uh, expand productivity. I mean, I, I believe very firmly that that is the case, that shallow markets are an obstacle to large scale investments in productivity, right? Because you, it's like the agricultural treadmill works faster if you're selling into a shallow market. So, I do believe in a deep way that if that as one deepens markets, you enhance the incentives to expand productivity. 
So of course this dream was in our mind and of course it was in our grant proposals that this could happen, uh, but we don't see, I mean, you'll see the kinds of price effects that we're looking at. We, we really are not in any very substantial way seeing an overall upward shift in prices. Fundamentally, what we're seeing is this decrease in, in dispersion across markets. And so I think the, that is a less fundamental, it's, it's, it's a second order effect, not a first order effect. And so we don't pick up anything that looks like a real supply expansion from the study. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that we did that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's, it, we, we were hoping to, but it's not there. Okay, um, so just to talk a little bit about the, the, the literature and kind of motivate what we're doing then. So, uh, you know, we have this literature, uh, which I think uh, many people here have been involved in, much of which is really talking about the advent of mobile phones as a way of getting a view on how markets change uh, when, when improved search technology comes in. So we have uh, Jensen's famous paper, which is looking at fisheries, uh, the, the Acre paper, which is looking at grain markets in Niger and is in some sense kind of the most similar paper to this one. Um, and then, and then uh, Treb Allen's recent uh, paper in Econometrica. Um, so the idea is that, that you know, at, at, a, at an immediate level, uh, search barriers are going to thwart otherwise profitable trades, and they're going to lead to violations of the law of one price, uh, simply because people don't realize that, that, that the, the dispersion is as large as it is. More interestingly, at some level, is the idea that search also becomes a vehicle for market power for intermediaries, right? So that when a farmer and a trader are negotiating with each other, if the farmer has no idea what prices the trader will receive, that that gives the trader an extra source of market power. Um, and when you're, when you're out on the ground surveying these markets, there is very much kind of a fog of war uh, that, that no one will give you a straight answer to, to what they're selling for, and that there's a sort of a strategic deception that goes on where it is in the interests of the people who understand prices well that their counterparties don't understand prices well. So, so Goyal has like a hoteling circle model and then Antras and Kostino have a model that is based on the idea that, you know, a, a effectively any farmer negotiating with any specific trader doesn't know what's going on, worries about having that trader walk away from them and then being left with no one to sell to, and so in their market, what they're basically saying is that as you have more traders in a market, that information asymmetry becomes less important in the farmer's mind, and they're still willing to drive a hard bargain, even if they don't really understand what prices are. So these are kind of two different ways of thinking about why it would be the case that bad information actually puts market power into the hands of intermediaries. Now, of course, for our intervention, this is a very important distinction, right? Because at some simple level, uh, you know, the first set of explanations, as, as we were discussing previously, is really saying that as you as you improve information, you you generate convergence. But if you have a sample that is representative of the overall market, there's no reason to think that the mean shifts. Whereas if these if these market power explanations are important, then it really should be the case that as you as you improve information, as you improve search as you give farmers outside options, you actually boost their market power and therefore will lead to a, a real improvement in uh, a, a first order improvement in farm day prices, right? So these stories, obviously the second story depends on the first, but in a way for us, it's very important whether the second story is operative or not, because you know, the, the sort of big welfare claim around these interventions, which is you know, that the vast majority of the population are farmers and the traders are very few, that you know, from that perspective alone, you would like to be advantaging the farmers, and you would like to be finding ways to push farm gate prices up. Okay, um, so uh, so so uh, obviously, the spread of mobile phones has dramatically reduced search costs. And uh, you know, again, we we have to understand the background here is a very well informed background because mobile phones are completely ubiquitous. I mean, most of the traders that we talk to have. You know, not only do they have a phone, they have a phone on every single mobile network in the entire country. They're sort of clipped all over their belts as they go around, right? So, so these are very, very well-informed individuals. So maybe not surprisingly, given that, 
the there have been a number of recent RCTs that have been based on disseminating price information. These are usually kind of SMS style interventions where 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 price information is being texted out. And overall, this literature has been pretty disappointing. Okay, so the the kind of general takeaway from this literature is that these these price information only interventions just don't work very well. Um, there is an argument that they don't work where, very well because people already knew what you told them. The Hildebrandt et al. paper, which is the most recent one, is making an argument a little bit more along the lines of what Pedro is just saying, which is that that they work so well and the information disseminates so fast that you can't keep a treatment control split in an RCT because the because the control just becomes uh, informed too quickly for there to be a real wedge in information. So. In a sense, both of those explanations are due to mobile phones, the ubiquity of mobile phones, but they're, they're very different from each other because obviously there is a welfare benefit under the second explanation and there is not under the first. Um, so, so you know, we designed this project against this background of this sense that information only isn't enough. And so what we were trying to think about is how can you pair together an information intervention with a real market trading opportunity that really gives the farmers a different outside option, right? Because if they're facing a more or less monopsonist buyer, you know, it, it may just be totally insufficient for them to say, hey, I know the price that you're going to sell for is such and such. That I can still say, well, take it or leave it. And, and, and if I walk, you're out of luck, right? So, so, so in other words, we, our logic in setting the platform up was you have to inform farmer. You have to inform traders that farmers are informed. You have to give traders an outside option and you have to inform the traders that the farmers have an outside option. And that that's, that's the structure that will shift bargaining power. So, so you know, there are a number of really interesting efforts underway to improve market efficiency. These include a number of, uh, you know, kind of app, platform types of things that are, are in many ways similar to what we were experimenting with. And then also a number of big important African countries are now setting up centralized commodities exchanges and have understood that an ICT component that goes along with a commodity exchange is going to be very important to making them function correctly deep into rural areas in terms of what we would like to see happen. So, um, Again, the idea here is, is both that farmers would have option, would have access to a, a wider set of tra traders when they're selling, and also that traders would have a wider geographic area, would be able to compete more, and that those benefits would, would, would trickle up to farmers. So, uh, Craig, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I just have a question about yeah. the last point you made in yeah. the previous slide. Have you looked at uh, maybe uh, new? markets for a premium quality. I'm thinking about the work of Tessa Baldus, Vincent and Cortes. So these missing markets for premium quality maize in Uganda. Uh, have you seen or uh, are you interested in looking at maybe uh, niche markets out of this more information available? Yeah, so, so we did gather uh, quality data and really at the end of the day, most of the maize markets that we're looking at, which are, you know, the large volume of long distance trade in maize in Uganda, it is pretty homogeneous. It's pretty commodified. Um, the, the main driver of quality in Ugandan maize is the WHO. Uh, I'm sorry, it's WFP, WFP, sorry. They, so they run a large network of uh, storage uh, uh, warehouses, which they use uh, for uh, food aid programs. And they buy a lot from Uganda because it produces a lot of maize. They have very rigorous standards uh, for you know, uh, contaminants in the maize and humidity levels, uh, purity, et cetera. And, and they have the machinery to test that quality. So, so the way most of Ugandan maize, the way it works is basically that the WFP kind of skims the high quality maize off the top, that goes into the warehouses and is stored for long term against famines, and that then the remainder of the maize that is sloshing around in day to day markets is below that quality. Um, but, you know, the traders still impose quality bars. So, so in, in, the, in the markets that we're looking at, we just have not found quality to be a huge um, that's not to say that there are not products like coffee or things like that for which, you know, quality recognition on the ground is extremely important. 
but I think it is more or less fair to say that the large majority of the maize moving in uh, in Uganda can be thought of as being of commodified quality. I mean, even in terms of why deals fell apart, they very rarely fall apart because of quality disagreements. They fall apart because of price disagreements. Thank you. Okay, so um, so so uh, there are a number of studies, you know, looking at at, at different kinds of, of platforms to try to understand, you know, can one facilitate trade in this way? Uh, a number of these have been in India, where the government has actually been engaged in setting up kind of terminal types of platforms that are broadcasting prices out into into trading towns. Um, that evidence is fairly mixed, I would say. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is, like I said, go beyond sending out price information to do this full market matching, uh, to study the impacts on intermediaries as well as farmers, and then to do randomization at this very large scale level where the sub counties include, you know, on average, I think it's 11 markets per sub county. And that means that, you know, we're able to both look at GE effects and not have those GE effects destroy the research design of the RT. So, just a kind of motivating figure, you know, basically what we see is that when we look at uh, the observed average, so this is the smoothed average price dispersion across market dyads by distance. Um, and then this is just the linearized slope. If you take the, the average transport cost per kilometer reported across all of the surveys that we did, you know, basically what you're seeing here, I think is something that maybe also motivates the answer to Pedro's earlier question, which is, when you get into very long distance markets, right, because the slope of price dispersion rises much more slowly than the slope of transport costs, at long distances, the large majority of the observed price dispersion is from transport costs. And that, and that as you get into very nearby markets where the transport costs are very low, that then the fraction of price dispersion that is not explained by transport costs is much higher. And so consequently, you might think that just from looking at this picture that you would in some sense have more power with an information intervention uh, to move market outcomes at, at these distances than these distances. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Is that price dispersion big? I mean, uh, 100 Ugandan shillings is not big, right? No, it's not big, but I mean, this is per kilo, right? So uh, okay. yeah, so so no, it's, 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 uh, it's gonna be, let me see, does the next slide have it in dollars? No, this is still in Ugandan shillings. So um, yeah. no, but, but so it's, you know, the, the median, uh, so the median yeah. percent of, uh, is 50%. Okay, so maybe that's an easier way to have the conversation, right? So, yeah. so in, in the median dyad, uh, just over half of the price dispersion is coming from transport costs, which means you know just barely less than half is is unexplained, right? So there's a lot there. There's a lot of violations of the law of one price, and there's a lot of dispersion that shouldn't be there. In some way. Got it. Okay, so um, this is a table of summary statistics on the way that traders behave, um, and and the way that they operate in markets. So. You know what we're seeing is that, like, let's say in terms of purchases, uh, there's 11 and a half uh, attempts to to purchase per week using phone, um, and then uh, a little under nine attempts per week to purchase without prior information, meaning that they just go somewhere and try to buy without having called in advance. So more than half of the attempted purchases uh, that that traders are engaging in are initiated by mobile phone. Okay, so it's showing the importance of, of the way that they operate. You see that on average, they have many more purchases per week than they have sales per week. Um, and in general, the kinds of traders that we're studying are, you know, driving around in rural areas and making a lot of little purchases, kind of farmer by farmer, maybe, uh, you know, a, a half a ton at a time. Uh, aggregating that together, most of these traders then have a shipping container that they sit in the local market, they come back and they fill up that shipping container over the course of time. And then when that shipping container is full, they then arrange to sell downstream into these larger hub markets. So you see many more purchases than sales, um, and, the, and the purchases are smaller than the sales are. Um, you see that the traders are, almost half of them are using the radio to get price information. But fewer than 10% at baseline are using any kind of SMS service to, to get prices. So despite the fact that 
you know, there are a couple of firms in Uganda offering this kind of service. It's, it's not used very much. Um, <clears throat> here we see the, the error that traders make in trying to guess what the prices are in their own spoke market, uh, in their hub market, which is going to be, let's say, like the district market in the district that they live in. Um, and then we're, we, we, we designated four markets that we call super hubs. And those, as I said, are Kampala and then the three markets that sell out into adjacent countries. So you see that they are indeed less well informed about the markets that are further away. Um, and these are in percentage terms. So the, the, the traders are making like fairly large mistakes in terms of, in terms of their understanding of, of, uh, of prices. So they certainly are not perfect at this despite the ubiquity of phones. Um, and then 83% of farmers list information as a barrier to expansion. And it's worth just saying how incredibly time sensitive, you know, if you're, if you're telling a trader a price that is now three or four days old, they discount it almost entirely. So when we say prices, we mean prices right now, because I'll, I'll show you, there's just a huge time series fluctuation that sits under these markets. Most of the fluctuation is time series, but it's enormous. And especially during the trading season, it tends to move very, very quickly, right? You come into the trading season with prices very high, and then as trading picks up, prices, prices plummet. And so it's very easy to lose money if you buy and hold in the wrong time in the wrong way. So the traders are very, very sensitive. So when they say information, they don't mean geez, I have no idea what the price is somewhere else. They mean I need to know absolutely right now what things are trading for because that's the, that's the only information that gives me the confidence. Okay. So here we're looking at farmer search now. So, so for farmers, we see they're very unlikely to use the radio, right? Almost half of the traders were using the radio, only 6% of farmers. The fraction of farmers using SMS services is actually fairly similar to, to the fraction of, of traders. Um, and then we see that farmers are in general a little bit less well informed about market prices than traders, right? When we look to traders at 16, 17, and 23% mistakes, um, and here we have 22, 20, and 29, right? So, so in general, farmers are indeed a little bit less well informed about prices um, and are, are somewhat surprisingly perhaps not using radio very much to keep up with them. Um, looking at the markets, so just to, uh, the, the, the markets are, yeah, please. Just a, a small question. How, how are they informed about prices, the farmers? If it's not by radio and it's not by SMS, where, where do they get their price information from? Well, I mean, in general, it will be the phone, right? So, so most of these farming households do have phones. Um, there are also farmer organizations. Uh, they may be traveling back and forth to markets and asking by word of mouth. So. You know, the, the, their information is, is relatively poor, but not terrible. And, and it's going to be, I think, primarily mobile phones are the way that they're, they're understanding what's going on. And in general, of course, the farmers are going to have a much more localized concern about what prices are, right? That they're, they're not going to be able to interact with distant markets anyway. So traders need to understand what prices are in markets in very distant places. And it may be that farmers don't really need to understand that. So in a sense, they have a better defined information problem. Um, and it is interesting to see that, like, for example, the hub price here is the one that they know about. And the hub price is where their traders are going to be selling their, right? So in other words, their counterparty sells into the hub. And if you look at it, they're, they're almost as well informed as traders are in terms of what the hub price. Okay, so, no, I guess, uh, thanks for the explanation. I guess my question was to which extent the farmers get the price information by the traders because of this uh, proximity between the, the hub prices. I mean, from what we've seen, you know, in, in a sense, your, your, your trader might better be thought of as your adversary than, than your ally. Uh, okay. And in a way is at some level kind of the last person that you would want to ask what prices are. This is the person who has a very strong incentive uh, to tell you that prices are terrible uh, in the hub market, right? So uh, it, it, it's an interesting question. I, we we didn't actually ask specifically this this question, but let, let me let me give it let me give you another. So we we did run some lab experimental games, which I won't talk about at all, um, to try to kind of understand the way that, that that farmers and traders negotiate. But one of the things that we did playing a lab game with real farmers and real traders is that 
we so we had like a randomly drawn market price and blah 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 we informed the traders which farmers knew their price that they were going to be selling at and in the lab experiment we observed that the the traders avoid informed farmers so they will they will they will pay a cost to negotiate with an uninformed farmer relative to negotiating with an informed farmer so it really does kind of emphasize the extent to which this this is an adversarial informational relationship, and uh, the traders prefer their counterparties to be poorly informed. Okay, so so then just looking a little bit at, at can, kind I, of the can I just can I please. just ask another quick question? Yes, so please. have you tr have you tried to also measure uncertainty? in the way they report prices price gases or it's just like a pure point estimate what you what you ask yeah we did have the question how confident are you and it was just like a likert scale um and i don't think that we've really used it would you find that more convincing than the error no, I, will, I i guess that's one i suppose that some people that's like for example when you measure expectations you might want to ask about some minimum and maximum just to understand uh because you know it might just be that people are just very uh they're just guessing in a different way when you ask about being closer or further away so i was wondering whether you tried to do that yeah the min the min and the max is an interesting idea because that is directly parameterizing the uncertainty i think that we didn't do that and we only asked what do you think the price is and how certain are you I don't believe we've used the answers to how certain they are. So that, that it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good reminder to go back and look through that again and and make sure that I understand exactly what we did there. I, I think you're right that that's an important way of thinking. About it. So, uh, thank you. Okay, so so looking at the number of traders in a market, so the the average is is just under seven. Um, the the uh, Herfindahl index uh, in in the competitive uh, markets is uh, 0.8 moderately concentrated 0.17, highly concentrated 0.75. Um, and then you're seeing that even at the sub-county level, the CR4 is 77, meaning that the top four traders control 77% of the trade, even at the sub-county level. So these markets have a lot of operators in them, but they are very sharply distinguished between some, some very large traders and then a large number of small traders. Okay, so then a little bit more detail about the way the platform works. Um, so, so Kudu is uh, this uh, matching algorithm paired with, you know, a front end GUI that was developed uh, at Makere University. Um, and so we basically came in and kind of piggybacked on them and, and scaled their product uh, as a part of the RCT. The buyers and sellers uh, the, the system knows where you are. When you register into the system, it, it, you tell it where you are, especially on the seller side. And then all you have to do basically is get into the system and say, I have this amount of this commodity and this is my reservation price for it. Um, and it will then engage in a daily Pareto optimal matching of supply and demand. Um, it tries to you know, maximize market welfare every day and it will directly connect up buyers and sellers. Um, we were using information both that we gathered off of Kudu and that we gathered from our market surveys to set up this system that we called the SMS blast. So we were sending 25,000 text messages a month as a part of that blast uh, to buyers and farmers and traders uh, all throughout our market system in the treatment areas to try to, to improve information. Um, uh, it, it's, then, then we worked with a, a private sector firm called Agrinet. Um, Agrinet went out uh, and tried to recruit a bunch of commission agents who were uh, basically all traders that were already operating in the market that they were going to then give commissions to, and the CAs would come in and they would broker trade for Agrinet and they would take a commission. What we ended up finding throughout the study, and I'll talk about this more at the end, is that it is very difficult to add a brokerage margin over the top of the way that these trades are operated. So the Agrinet model was pretty unsuccessful. Most of the CAs just continued to operate as independent traders. They were very heavy users of Kudu, but they were using it for themselves as buyers and sellers, and they were not using it under the offices of Agrinet. So in the end, 
we realized that we really just had to kind of do this ourselves. And so we ended up uh, hiring eight full-time staff who traveled around in the treatment areas, worked at promotion, got people signed up on the system, uh, helped to broker trades when they were moving through, et cetera. Um, and so then all of the traders in the treatment areas and a randomized three quarters of farmers were, were enrolled into the SMS class system that we used to publicize pricing. Craig, what's the, um, just real, real quick on Kudu. So, so what, what's like the business model of Kudu, like at, you know, in the scale up, like how, how, where's their margin? Yeah, so so that's a that's something that we talk about in the in the paper. We so we have kind of a section on like how do you monetize any of this, right? So so what what I think the honest answer to that question is is that the takeaway from this project is that to actually sit in the middle of these trades and intermediate them and capture revenue from that intermediation is extremely difficult to do. The trades move so fast. Most of the trades are very small. And that then to intermediate, you actually have to like sit someone on the ground who is capturing, right? It's, it's so easy for them to exchange uh, money via mobile money now that for you to actually sit in the middle of that and intermediate that trade, you know, it's slow. You have to expend cost to put the person in there. And these are very fast moving markets that deal with a lot of small trades. So I think realistically speaking so so kudu until we were involved had always been grant supported and it was it was basically being run as a public service um i think the honest answer to your question is the thing that kudu generates that is easily marketable is price information right because it, it actually reveals in a very credible way opportunity you know you know reservation prices on the on on both sides of the market in a very large number of locations every single day right so it is in and of itself telling you information that it would be extremely expensive and difficult to survey in an incentive compatible way so so there we have a little section in the paper kind of talking about how could the various participants in this project actually monetize what we find here and I think our impression is that really the only easily monetized feature of Kudu is to then build a subscription service for the price information. And it is basically kind of shedding that price information almost incidentally through the way that it works. It's a very cheap system to operate, right? So the operating costs are low. It's really just maintaining the servers. Uh, uh, so so it's, it's not that costly to fund, but the idea that they can intermediate through it, it's the whole point of the platform is that it isn't intermediated, right? Um, and before we were involved, what was happening with Kudu was that, you know, they would see that they had a match. They would see that they had connected a buyer with a seller. And then they would basically say, okay, great. We, we got some business here. They were not realizing that it was something like 1% of the connected buyers and sellers were actually engaging in trade. But it's very expensive to figure that out because you now have to be following everyone up and calling them and checking what happened. So we raised the survey money to do that through IPA. So we were then able to follow up the universe of matches and understand what happened. That was not something that they had been doing before. So they had been seeing the matches as success. And we were able to show them that, in fact, the matches are very, very far from success. Um, and indeed, we, we actually ended up finding that in many cases, human beings sitting in an office staring at the back end of the data were better at doing matches. So, so we, we set up a hand matching process as well as the algorithm that, that sits in the back of Kudu. And in fact, our hand matching process ended up with a higher success rate than the, than the matching algorithm. Huh. Cool. Right on. Okay. It's a pretty primitive answer to a high tech question. <laughs> okay. So, so then just looking at the study area on the left is a graph, uh, a map from the FuseNet project, which is, is showing the grain surplus areas of, uh, uh, of Uganda in light green. And then on the right, we're showing the study district. So more or less, we're operating in maize surplus areas and we're operating in areas that don't sit right on major highways because the supposition was that those were gonna be you know, relatively well integrated in the first place. And so basically the study sample is grain surplus areas that are not immediately well networked as a function of their infrastructure. Um, this is a little consort diagram. I think I've talked through most of this. Uh, 
already just to highlight the fact that we have the sub-county level randomization of treatment control. And then we also randomized at the farmer level whether that farmer was going to be receiving the SMS information in the study or not. So that gives us a little bit of individual variation there. Um, so the project ran for, for three years and that there, there are two harvest seasons a year. So that covers uh, six harvest seasons. To talk a little bit about the platform usage. So, so during the, the three years that we ran the platform, so we had about 24,000 uh, asks that were put on the platform. 45% uh, of them were from study traders of whom 14% were CAs and 6% from study farmers. So that means that almost half of the total asks that were ever put on the platform didn't come from people in the study. So that's already kind of some indication of the fact that we're, we're reaching in, into a scale that is bigger than just the people that we're looking at. Um, and then in terms of bids, we had over 30,000 unique bids. Um, and again, uh, just about half of those are coming from outside of the study population. Uh, we had 73,000 tons of grain transacted, which sort of sounds like a lot. If you had to pick it up, it would be a lot, but obviously is a tiny fraction of the total trade that was occurring in these markets over the course of those three years. Um, and maize accounts for 67% of the successful transactions. Most of what I'll talk about uh, today is going to be just on maize markets. We really did not see any effect on the other markets. Despite the fact that the maize market is by far the best integrated one in the first place. So for example, we also studied tomatoes uh, because we thought the tomato market might be a more interesting one because it's perishable. And indeed we see that there's just kind of chaos in the tomato market all the time. But again, coming back to the conversation that we had before, to move tomatoes any large distance, you need refrigerated trucks. The pecuniary costs of that trade are enormous. And so it's kind of going along with this general sense that the, the high transport cost trade is more difficult to budge with, a, with an information intervention. With the, 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 the search problem is a smaller part of that overall cost. Um, and therefore, this kind of intervention is going to have a hard time moving it. So some level, the opportunities to profit in the tomato market seem to be much larger. And yet we never got any purchase on the tomato market at all. And I think that that is, is really, again, coming from the costs of trading in tomatoes. OK. Um, all right. So, so then looking at, looking at impacts. So these are just fan regressions of, uh, uh, sorry, these are just smoothed uh, uh, volumes looking across distance. And so what we're doing here is taking the market dyads in the study. And so then the solid line here is uh, the control group. The dashed line is the uh, our dyads where one of the two was in the treatment, and then the dotted line are dyads that were both treated. And so what we're seeing here is uh, a reasonable improvement in the probability that there is any trade, but only at short distances. Uh, a reasonable increase in the number of traders, but only at short distances. Uh, quite a large increase in trade volumes at small distances. And then when we look at price dispersion across markets, we see you know, effects that are taking place across longer distances. But again, you know, the most pronounced effects being you know, at this kind of 100 kilometer distance rather than uh, in very far apart markets, okay? So, so this kind of summarizes the overall takeaway of the dyadic data, which is fairly large effects, but only at quite short distances. So then just to look at this in regression form, um, these are impacts on trade flows. If we pool all of the markets together, right, so across all distances, uh, then what we're seeing is, you know, a muted effect, significant, just barely significant for one treated. Um, we have fewer markets that are both treated than one treated. So that, I think, explains the power difference between these estimates. So, you know, a, a just barely significant increase overall in the number of traders and a just barely significant decrease in price dispersion when we split by above and below median distance, then we're seeing you know, more significant effects show up in the, uh, in the half of the distribution that is relatively nearby, and then really absolutely nothing at all going on in these more distant markets, okay? So that's the general spirit of all of these results is in the dyadic data, the dyads that we moved are the dyads that are nearby. Um, we moved them both because we increased any trade, because we increased the number of traders, we increased volumes, 
And the, the net effect of that increase in movement is a decrease in prices, okay? So then looking at surplus versus deficit areas then, so what we're seeing here, so, so this dashed line is the uh, smoothed price across the distribution of baseline marketed surplus uh, in the treatment areas. And then the dotted line is the control areas. And so basically what you're seeing here is that there is a very pronounced price slope across surplus and deficit areas in the control group. And that what the intervention is doing is more or less flattening out that slope, meaning that surplus and deficit areas have effectively the same price, right? So this is kind of the mechanism for that price convergence is moving grain from places where it is plentiful to places where it is scarce. Um, and then on the right-hand panel, this is just basically the fan regression of the gap here. Um, and is, is showing that we have, uh, you know, not quite significant, uh, decreases in uh, in price in the places that were the uh, most surplus, um, and then significant increases in the markets that were relatively surplus uh, at baseline. Okay, so at some level, this is exactly what you would have expect to have happen: is you know, the information should decrease dispersion, and the specific way in which it should decrease dispersion is to move grain from markets where it's plentiful to markets where it's less plentiful. So then looking at the total overall effect on, uh, on market prices now, right? So these are prices that are surveyed in the market. So, so uh, this is asking in your market today, what is the price? So we have three ways of thinking about price and they're all subtly different from each other in kind of an interesting way, right? Because the market price is a GE quantity that is fixed in location. The farm gate price is fixed in location because it's always the same farmer, but there is a lot of latitude, like basically the place that you would really expect market power to show up is in the gap between the market price and the farm gate price, right? So you might expect that you were moving the farm gate price even if you didn't move the market price. And then when you ask traders prices, traders prices, you're asking them like, what did you actually pay and what did you actually receive? given that we've shown you that the intervention changed their spatial pattern of trade, right? There's an extra margin that is open for traders because you're now not asking about a, tri a price at any well-defined place. You're asking about the price that they actually got and their prices may move. You could actually have no change in farm gate prices and no change in market prices and still see a change in the prices that traders are reporting because they are now buying and selling in different markets, right? So it's kind of important to recognize that these are not three views of the same thing. The, the prices as reported from the market survey, the farmer survey and the trader survey are really qualitatively different from each other in an important way. So looking at the market prices, there's absolutely no effect on prices on average. Um, and then if you now split by a uh, market of surplus or not, then you're seeing what we just saw in the picture before, which is uh, a decrease if you are not in a surplus area and increase if you are in a surplus area, the differential is significant. And when you add these two together, you're getting just about no effect, okay? So then moving to the traders and looking, looking in some detail at what we see there. So the, the, uh, so the, the fraction of the traders who had heard of Kudu is very high. Uh, uh, those who had received price information uh, it goes up by almost 50%. Um, those who used Kudu, we have a huge wedge in the use of Kudu. Uh, a much smaller wedge in successfully completing a deal on Kudu, but we still have 20% of the treatment farmers, uh, more than 20% completing a deal. Um, no effect on their price error. So it doesn't look like we were able to move their understanding of prices. Um, and then a big understanding that it changed what, what farmers knew, and they are telling us that it changed their negotiations with farmers. Okay, so the traders report that the platform changed the way that they negotiate with farmers, okay? Um, so then looking at impacts on traders, we see a, a decrease in profits, which is, you know, only significant at the 10% level, but, but, you know, quite important 15% decrease overall in terms of their total profit margin. The amount that they trade goes up, their markups go down slightly, 
And then the core effect here is that the sales price is changing in a manner that uh, that is explained by whether they're selling uh, from surplus areas or from deficit areas. Okay, so basically the squeeze is coming on traders as a result of a squeeze on their prices. In, in the previous slides, um, the control group had a very large percentage of uh, farmers that were aware of Kudu. So, I mean, is this some sort of contamination or yeah, it is. That's actually, the, the in the control group, people were also using the platform. So to that extent, your effects are underestimating the effect of the platform? Yeah, I, I think it's correct to say that this is a form of contamination that pretty definitely leads us to underestimate the, the total effect. I think that's fair to say. I mean, you call this pretty large, but I mean, you know, the, the, the rate is what, four, four times as high, more than four times as high. And the rate here is, is you know, eight times as high. So, you know, as a study with two-sided non-compliance, we have a pretty big wedge between the treatment and the control. But yes, you're absolutely right that this makes it very clear that something was happening in the control group as well. And it's, it's very difficult to tell a story that that something is not leading us to underestimate total effects. Okay, so then I think another interesting thing that we see with farmers is that, is that we reduce the heterogeneity in farmer markup, uh, sorry, with traders. We, redu re we reduce the heterogeneity in trader markup. So this is looking at the baseline markup that they were receiving. And what we're doing now is we're smoothing the end line markup over the baseline markup. And so what we see is that in the control group, right, the baseline predicts the end line very well. And in the, treat in the treatment group, that's really flattened out. And so what we've done is basically increase markups for bad traders and decrease markups for good traders. So we've, we've homogenized. It's like saying that trading was a more highly skilled occupation before this intervention came, that this intervention took some of the skill out of trading, right? So uh, there was a big difference between a good trader and a bad trader in the control group, and the intervention reduced that difference substantially, right? So, so it's, it's decreasing the scope for trade, it's decreasing the returns to good information, and it's homogenizing returns across traders, which I think is another interesting form of convergence, right? So there's there's a number of quite distinct ways in which we see convergence in this study. And this is another one is convergence across traders in the markups that they're able to achieve. So, okay, okay, so uh, just a, a question, Craig. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, so you're, you're looking at maize, but uh, to a certain extent there is for the good traders, these, these are uh, opportunities to, to reach out to different people and uh, and probably there is good opportunities that are uh, that are coming out that were not there before. And now I'm reaching out to different people, and I'm actually uh, able to strike uh, deals on on other stuff that is not necessarily maize, but uh, but other other products. Um, so I was wondering about uh, you have you have uh, you have shown I, I didn't understand the, the 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 table on profits whether that's. Uh, um, it's profits overall or, or, or specific to, to, these, uh, to these commodities? Yeah, that's a very good question. So these profits are overall. Uh, these tons traded are overall, but the markups and the prices are maize only. Um, so, so maize does make up the very large majority of the trading revenue of the traders that we studied. I mean, again, we're in maize growing areas. We're studying maize trading markets. So we, we geared the whole study towards maize, but you are raising an interesting question about essentially like the spillover into different crops. I think that's what you, your basic point, right? That, that if, if, we've, if we've hurt the margins on maize, did we actually push people to increase the share of trading and other crops. And we have not actually looked directly at, at that uh, question. I think that's a very, that's a very good one. So I'll, I'll follow up with that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so then uh, this is now the same kind of manipulation check table for the farmers. So uh, again, pursuant to our previous conversation, right? 12% of control farmers had heard of Kudu. The fraction of control farmers that were receiving SMS information is double what it was in the baseline, right? So, so again, potentially some contamination, but still a very large wedge. Um, completed a deal on Kudu. This is a little depressing, right? So only 2% of the 
treatment farmers ever successfully completed a deal. So it really does not look like this platform is working through farmers accessing it directly and benefiting from trading on it. But then we are seeing, for example, that almost a quarter of the farmers are using SMS price information when they negotiate. So that's another way of saying, you know, there is a causal pathway for an impact here that isn't moving through using Kudu per se. Um, uh, so then looking at the farmer impacts, you know, this is where the power loss is a little frustrating, or I shouldn't say loss, the low power is a little frustrating, right? So, you know, we're seeing effects on revenues that are on the order of about 10%. Um, on maize, they're even a little bit bigger than 10%. Um, there is some evidence here that both the quantities that they're selling and the prices that they're selling at are going up overall. So the magnitudes are not so tiny in this table, but absolutely nothing is significant. And again, I kind of bring this back to, this is 55 treatment clusters versus 55 control clusters. So despite being massive, it's actually not that well powered statistically, right? Um, so then, uh, we pre-registered the idea that we would we would estimate a propensity score on their propensity to use Kudu and look for heterogeneity by that. And here, what we're seeing is that when we do that, we do see that both farmer revenues and the quantity sold are significantly higher for the kinds of farmers who had a high propensity to use the platform. Um, and then another heterogeneity cut is just looking at so so here what we're doing is is plotting this across the baseline marketed surplus of the farmer so how much was the farmer selling at baseline and then what we're seeing is pretty much across the board although there are not many farmers who are up in this right tail for the farmers who are up in this right tail now we're starting to see really big effects on revenues really big effects on maize revenues pretty big improvements in quality sold and also large improvements in prices as well Okay, so very regressive, right? Because th this red line is the density. So the vast majority of the farmers are, are in this tail down here where nothing is happening. And this is a very unusual kind of farmer to be marketing that much in the first place. But for those big farmers, now we're starting to see the kinds of impacts that you would have maybe hoped to see in terms of, of prices and revenue, okay? All right, so I, I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, go too long. So let me let me just make this part kind of quick. So so just to talk through a, a dense table fairly quickly, um, we spent uh, eight hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars over the course of three years on everything that was involved in running the intervention and in paying the field staff, sending out the SMS blast, gathering the market price data, operating Kudu. So everything that we did over the entire course of the project cost uh, uh, about 900,000 US dollars. Then if we take the trader revenue, right? So the, so the traders lose profits. Um, and so then what we can do is we can think about not just the number of traders in the sample, but we can, we can think about what is the population of traders that that sample is representative of we can multiply the profit loss per trader times the total number of traders of whom we should be representative. And we get to the idea that we have damaged, we've destroyed about a million and a half dollars worth of profit for traders. Now, when we come to the farmers, things are kind of complicated because obviously like if farmers were receiving our SMS blast, we can't say that that farmer is representative of the broader population of farmers in the study district. So there is one kind of farmer who is very, very important, which is the farmer that was in the more rural LC1s and who did not receive the blast. Those farmers are representative of almost a million farming households, right? And so what happens then is if we take the revenue effect in each of those four strata that come from whether they receive the SMS blast or not, and are they near or far, where there are many more far than near, right? So here we're looking at the number of households for whom that impact is supposedly representative, and we're then multiplying those out. And so then what this ends up showing is that because this group is so numerous, right, it contains almost a million households, that then this relatively muted revenue effect of uh, 13 total dollars increase in revenue on average for that type of farmer translates into a $34 million increase in total revenue across that whole group. And that number is so large that it completely dominates this calculation. 
and ends up with a net profitability then uh, a net a net benefit of the intervention of 32 million dollars but you know again that entire thing is coming from this idea that these farmers who were in rural remote lc1s and did not themselves receive the blast are representative of the whole population of farmers in their sub county okay so if you think that there are spillovers, for example, that go from the people who did receive the blast to the people who didn't, you might quarrel with whether you think those are really representative. And like clearly the overall straight ahead welfare gains are totally dominated by that, okay? So if you're willing to make that assumption, this is an enormously net positive intervention, but it's a very complicated one because it is coming at the cost of demonstrable damage to study participants, which is you know an unusual, feature of an RCT, fortunately, right? So, so this is this has teeth on it. This has this is a this is a ethically challenging cost benefit calculation in a way that usually you're just taking program costs against beneficiary benefits. And here we really are trading harm to some beneficiaries against benefit to other beneficiaries, but with a market intervention that's that's almost guaranteed to be the case. Then I'll just skip this over. I mean, basically, this is just kind of a little schematic for how to think about the other welfare benefit, which is not coming through because this is this calculation is all from the first order effects on average prices. There is, of course, another welfare benefit, which is coming from the price convergence. And so this is just kind of the canonical textbook way of thinking about how to do that kind of cost benefit calculation that you have, you know, basically, a, you have an area that represents, you know, a net transfer from um, from uh, consumers to producers in surplus areas and from producers to consumers in deficit areas. And then you have these triangles that represent the welfare increase. And so with estimates of the price changes and the quantity changes, we can then basically just kind of linearize these things. We've, we've run the regressions that should let us do this. The only problem that we're encountering, everything looks good in the surplus areas. So we see everything that we should see, increases in revenues, increases in food expenditure, uh, increases in harvests and a decrease in the consumption of maize, right? So this is what we would expect to see that as the prices are going up in surplus areas, uh, consumers are switching away from eating maize as they decide to sell more of it. Um, unfortunately, when we then look in the deficit areas, we see things looking more or less correct here. Small decrease in revenue, small decrease in food expenditure, small decrease in quantity harvested but there's also a decrease in the quantity consumed. So this, this coefficient here is going in the wrong direction. So we're, we're a little bit hung up on how, to, uh, on, on how to do the calculation given that one of these coefficients is moving in the wrong direction. But that's, that's kind of the, the next step for, for how to think about that second order. Well, so so let me wrap up, yeah. Just coming back to my earlier question about effects on quantity, which you yes, said uh, were not uh, very large. Uh, so I, I'm uh, I'm not sure I follow this uh, big result in terms of welfare. So so it, this is not simply a matter of transferring surplus from traders to farmers. This is perhaps about allocating the production to traders that value the output the most. Is that what is driving this big increase in welfare? Well, yeah. So so I mean here. So like this would be this is the harvest effect. So there, there, there's two mechanisms, right? So I mean, the, 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 the really deep idea would be that as prices rise in surplus area, that harvests actually go up, right? So you see, I mean, the coefficient is in the right direction, but it's you know absolutely nowhere near significant and it is a very small effect relative to the mean. You still could have a fairly substantial increase in marketed surplus if, because these are households that are both consuming and producing maize, right? So, so you, you could still have a fairly large increase in the amount of grain hitting the market if on the consumption side, the households are switching away from consuming maize, they're selling more of it and now eating something else whose price has not gone up, right? So, so I think it is important to think about those two as being very independent decisions and that it's possible that you get a large increase in marketed surplus with no increase in absolute production, right? And that basically what's happening now is that in these surplus areas, you know, maize is becoming so valuable that people are deciding to switch their consumption over to other crops, right? So, you know, again, I, I don't know how much you wanna believe these numbers, but what these numbers would, would, would indicate is that, as we said to each other before, 
that that real production effect is very muted. But in fact, the consumption response is fairly large, and it's large enough that it is in fact leading to a pretty meaningful uh, a, a increase in the marketed surplus segment, right? So, I mean, this is a very old debate in you know developing country agricultural economics, how to think about production versus marketed surplus and which levers move which of those two things. And so, you know, I think my read on this would be basically to say this intervention was not deep enough and it didn't generate a credible and sustained enough increase in prices to really lead to that you know, that like next year I'm going to go out and I'm going to invest in more fertilizer or, or whatever it would take to really enhance productivity, that really at the end of the day, what it is, is I'm sitting down at harvest time with a harvest that is pretty much what it would have been anyway. And now I'm making some decisions on the margin about how much I want to sell. And it is influencing that. I also ask, um, you, you presented some uh, descriptive statistics indicating that the, say, the Erfindal index was very high yeah. uh, and the number of uh, uh, traders per market was relatively small, about seven, if, I'm, uh, if I yes. remember correctly. Uh, yes. I mean, so, so, so this platform increases the sort of the, the, the actual degree of competition in these, uh, in these markets. I mean, could, could you compute an estimate of, say, the, the increase uh, or the decrease in this case of the effective uh, Erfindal index following the introduction of the platform? Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. We have not done that, and that's a great idea. We absolutely we absolutely should do that. I mean, let me just say, most of these markets have a small number of traders because they are very small markets, right? So, I mean, you know, you, you should not be picturing you know thousands of people standing around. This is basically like kind of a clearing in the middle of the village that has a bunch of storage containers in it and. You know, so, so many of what we're calling markets are pretty deep rural markets. And I think that's one of the things that makes the project interesting is that we don't often study those small markets, right? Where there are like 19 large markets in Uganda that are very heavily studied. There's a bunch of price subscription surveys that are looking at them. And so, you know, it's part of the interesting feature of this study is that we are getting out and being able to speak to the way that those much smaller markets work. So, in a sense, the fact that our average number of traders is so small is not really in and of itself an indication of concentration because they're just very small markets. But I think to me, the thing that I find very surprising is that even at the sub-county level, you know, sub-counties are very big, you have such a high CR4 index, right? That, that even in those very large areas, you really do have a few totally dominant traders in some volume. So that was not what I had expected. I had thought it was gonna be a bit more of a free for all with many, 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 many small traders. And in fact, even in these quite rural places, there are really dominant large traders. So, but your idea is a great one. We haven't looked at it and I, I definitely will, will do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so just to wrap up, um, you know, it, it, it looks like, so if the big question was, what can we achieve with a million dollar investment instead of the billions of dollars of investment? The answer is something. <laughs> it's a, it, we can achieve something. We can generate some convergence. We can uh, squeeze a little bit of those information rents out of those markets. And kind of the main takeaway here is that, you know, the traders adjust very quickly and they adjust in a very strong spatial pattern. So it really changes where they go and how they trade. They have these other margins to adapt on. They, they adapt on volumes, they adapt on locations, but they're not able to fully compensate to use this platform totally to their benefit. Why? Is because the GE effect on squeezing price dispersion is exactly taking away the core source of profit. For them. That price dispersion is how they make their money. And if it had been a partial equilibrium result where only informed traders were figuring this out, you know, then they may have been able to benefit from it. But because it's a GE effect that the actual market prices are converging, it is truly taking away opportunities for profit for them. Um, we think that you know the, the, these results are indicating that these platforms, you know, their their welfare, the the welfare argument around these platforms is about scale, 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 scale. These are not that expensive to build, and they can influence millions of farmers. But the the results I think are sobering as well. That this idea that like the smallholder farmer is kind of you know under the heel of the trader, and that you can use these kinds of information platforms to liberate them really doesn't, we don't see any evidence of that being the case. And if anything, 
you know, the, on the farmer side, the ones who are able to benefit ultimately are the ones who are the wealthiest, the most market exposed and, and operating the most like traders in the first place. So, um, you know, I think, I think that basically, uh, I, I think that basically the main takeaway here is like, it's a plea that these are worth investing in. It's also a plea that these are very hard to measure and that the, the GE effects that sit under these, like even just the fact that we're getting an effect on one market treated in the dyadic analysis, that is a spillover effect, right? That is a form of spillover effect at some level. So this is definitely a study that has spillovers. We think the spillovers are leading us to underestimate everything. We also feel that you know the RCT modality is a real barrier to building a platform like this, right? You you want scale. You ideally you should be doing like mass radio advertising and things like that to build a platform like this. And with an RCT, you're always trying to kind of keep the treatment control differential, and that's really not the right way to think about this kind of intervention. So, in a number of ways, we think these are kind of lower bound estimates. Um, and if you're willing to believe this scaling up of these rural farmers, like even with those underestimates on net, we find this to be a really benefit. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Thank you very much, Greg. That, that's, uh, that was uh, a wonderful economics paper. So uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Um, uh, I think we have time for a, a, a couple of questions, if people have uh, any remaining question. Mathieu, please. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask about the, the, the next step. So do you have any anecdotal evidence about the level of trust of uh, small farmers in this kind of platform? I'm thinking, um, do people are afraid that uh, there might be some room to game the system and for some uh, large traders to kind of find a way to manipulate the information uh, at their advantage? And do you think is a credible threat to uh, when this uh, information system will become maybe paid, so you need to pay for the subscription to the intervention, to the information. Um, is it a concern? Yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, so so let me let me give a number of different ways of thinking about what you asked. So in terms of in terms of kind of the, the gaming of the system, the people who designed the Kudu platform were very confident. These are these are serious people and 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 members of the team have done things like design the US uh, auction of of, uh, of of high frequency spectrum for the FCC. And so a very, very sophisticated team have done a lot of deep market stuff. They were quite convinced that they had a mechanism set up that was going to correctly get people to kind of reveal their reservation price the first time they posted. And what we have found is that in general, the, uh, the bid prices on the system track market prices where the bid comes from very closely. So it looks like the people who are trying to buy on the system were putting what you might think of as kind of like correct prices in there that in general, they're putting in a price that maps very closely to the price that their markets are really selling at. The people who are selling onto the system, which are generally like smallholder farmers are not doing that. And they seem to be using the system kind of to bargain in a way, right? Like, that's the way that you would naturally expect a negotiation to take place is like, I, I start with a ridiculous price and then kind of see what happens and we negotiate our way down. There's no mechanism for bargaining in the platform, right? So that really doesn't work. And so, you know, the, we, had, we had had the dream, of course, that you would like turn this system on and immediately see this big margin between bid and ask prices that would indicate that there was a, you know, a nice juicy space to intermediate there. And what we saw absolutely the entire way through the platform is that on average, that margin was upside down. And that the ask prices that were being put in were kind of high in the sky. Well, let me, let me put this in here and see what happens kind of prices. And so kind of the main reason that we didn't end up transacting as much, I mean, that only a small fraction of the ask transact is that many of the asks were at prices that were completely out of line not just with what we're being paid in their local markets, but even with what we're being paid in the super hubs. Like they were asking for better prices than they could possibly have gotten anywhere in the world. So it really does look like the farmers were gaming the system. They were generally asking unreasonable prices and that we, we tried a number of things like, for example, broadcasting back with SMS 
the prices at which real deals were happening, and we were unable to ever move that. So it, it really does look like in general, despite our best efforts, there is kind of a gaming of the system from the farmer side in terms of what they were trying to get. Um, in terms of trust, you know, the, the trust is obviously a really big deal. We had an experiment that I didn't talk about at all, which was offering transport guarantees in a randomized way to certain, uh, certain deals on the system. What we were trying to do was to take out some of those risks that would be present. Like we were very aware of the fact that there's kind of a bundled trade and that, and that there are reputational effects and I may prefer to trade with someone who I already know for that reason. So like one of the barriers to anonymized trade is market risk of various kinds, transaction risk. So we actually did an experiment with an insurance product on that transaction risk and it had no result at all. It didn't, it didn't lead to higher levels of trade. So I guess I can't really say that that says that, that that risk wasn't a problem, but it wasn't a problem that we were able to solve with the insurance product that we bought. So I think the long and the short of the answer is yes, trust is a huge problem in these markets. Trust is very low and kind of nobody really believes anything until the buyer is there. Many people have had deals fall through. The farmers are desperate to sell. The traders don't wanna be holding grain longer than they have to. So everything needs to move very quickly. And if you take six hours too long to work out a deal, they just go with someone else. So trust is a really big issue. Um, I do think it's a barrier to making this kind of platform work, but uh, insofar as we saw direct evidence of people gaming the system, it didn't look like it was the traders gaming the system. It looked like they were using it in a fairly genuine way. And from a price perspective, it seemed more like it was the farmers gaming the system. Okay, if I may, just a very quick follow-up question. So uh, have, you, have you tried to look a bit of uh, maybe a heterogeneous effect um, for those who have as the only source of information the CUDU system against those who might double check the information they receive against uh, maybe another SMS system or the radio or uh, because you had some descriptive statistics at the beginning? And this might correlate with the facts you see at the top of the distribution in terms of uh, uh, the size of uh, the harvest, the revenues, and quality. That's a, that, it, that's a very good idea. We, we have the data, and no, we haven't cut it like that. So I, I think that's a really nice idea. Uh, but ju just, just explain to me what you have in mind, just so I, I fully understand. So uh, is the idea that we would see stronger effects there because they can double check? Or is the idea that we would see weaker effects there because they already knew? Uh, I can go both ways. My my prior was that uh, if I, at the beginning, I have a lot of uncertainty, so there is a lot of uh, information asymmetry, and I can double check at the beginning, and maybe Kudu is the cheapest way to get this information. So I can save time and money uh, on more expensive, like going to the locker market or interact uh, uh, with some uh, reciprocity, maybe involved with some uh, traders with whom I already have some uh, some history. Yeah. And now it opens up to more efficient uh, matches because I have like a very secure, double checked and yep. very cheap uh, source of information. Yeah, I think that's a really nice idea. We haven't looked at it and I, I will definitely do so. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, if there is no other question, let me just add a small question, which, uh, which uh, um, uh, it's on... Um, um, Entrance. So, so, you, so this is relatively uh, a long exercise, and I know that your design is not uh, targeting uh, good measure of uh, of new people entering this market. But, uh, but at the same time, you have you have this data from the platform. So, I was wondering whether uh, you could do something about uh, understanding what's the. I mean, whether there is. Uh, new entrants, because of course it could make a lot of sense that people that are used to take these opportunities are maybe switching a little bit their activity uh, in this direction, uh, while the old people that, that were already in the market before probably are uh, well they are actually losing from 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 the platform, but but also it's uh, it could be that they are less suited for for the platform. Then other so, so I was wondering about entry, uh, whether you could say something about that from, from the data in the, in the platform. I, I guess it would be possible. 
Yeah. yeah so, so you, you're, you're raising a question that we thought about in a way that we haven't done it. So that's, that's very useful. So what, what we have looked at is we, we have questions in the trader survey that are asking them to describe like the last 10 deals that they did. So where, where did they go? How much did they buy? Did they transport themselves? That, that, is a very rich source of information, right? Because it, in, in the correct RCT sense, it lets you look for everybody in a comparable way. And what we've been doing is trying to look at uh, like network density of how intensively a market was trading with treated markets at baseline. So we're trying to look at heterogeneity over the extent of trading network connection to the treatment. And so we've been doing a bunch of spillovers work using that survey data that I described and then heterogeneity by this network intensity. And what we're seeing there is very clearly that like control markets that are highly networked with treatment markets get a lot of entry from treated traders coming into them as a result of the platform. And that traded, sorry, that, that uh, traders, <laughs> Sorry, traders in control markets are getting hurt the most if they are most highly networked with the treatment because the treatment is giving their counterparty traders the ability to come in and trade against them. So that that is kind of in the spirit of what you're saying, and that's like just a set of results that we've been pulling together recently. You're you're proposing the use of Kudu data to do that, and I we really have not tried doing that, and I think it's a it's a good idea. I mean, of course, with the Kudu data, we don't know much about people, right? So unless they're in our study, really all we know about them is we have a phone number and we know that they're located somewhere outside of the study area. So it's it's not quite as rich and it doesn't sort of map to the RCT quite as well. But I think you, you're definitely right that we would be able to look at something like the the number of new entrants to a market on average through kudu treatment versus control something along those lines that that's what you had in mind i think so that's it. Yeah, i think i think it's a nice idea we we, we haven't tried that so I, I really appreciate that suggestion all right thank you very much craig um so if there is no other questions i think we are over time already so let me just uh, thank very much craig for his presentation. It was uh, a wonderful experience for us at Nova Africa. And, um, and uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Those are great comments. I really appreciate them very much.